Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. Everyone online, Eric, I'm muting your computer one moment. There's a little echo. Uh, all right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to Grand Rounds. Uh, it is a packed house for those of you online. It's almost standing room only, so we definitely want you to keep, uh, keep coming uh, in person. It's wonderful to, to see everyone. Uh, ethics conferences have been uh, really a pillar of education uh, at the Moran for many years. Certainly they were uh, among my most memorable grand rounds from my training and onward. Uh, we have uh, very much uh, upgraded to Dr. Eric Hansen, uh, both in terms of uh, his running today's grant, uh, today's ethics conference, but also he's going to be uh, really the director of our ethics conferences moving forward. Uh, he has a, a a background in philosophy, and he's a very thoughtful uh, person. You'll find his perspectives to be there, very thought-provoking, uh, and I can uh, recommend no one better for just a, a sit-down lunch uh, to have a conversation about anything than Dr. Hansen. So how much uh, is a picture worth is the title. Uh, without further ado, our ocular oncologist, uh, retina surgeon, uh, former international global fellow, uh, and ethics conference chair, uh, Dr. Eric Hansen. Awesome, thank you. Um, hopefully I can live up to the expectation of provoking thought and making this interesting. Um, I didn't actually have a lot of intention of uh, speaking uh, and making you listen to me for an hour about ethics. Uh, I don't have that much delusion of self-worth, but it turns out OCAPS is a tough time to recruit um, much thought into humanities and ethics for, for rightful reasons. And so, we do have a, a sneak peek for next year's uh, ethics conference around this time will be on um, the merits of standardized testing for segmenting society and defining futures. And I'll start taking volunteers for that discussion tomorrow. Um, so, but today um, you're stuck with me. And what I wanted to talk about is something that um, is actually been in the conversation in the literature as well as in the news um, a lot in recent years. Uh, primarily due to COVID um, and the way that it um, reshaped many aspects of our society. Um, but interestingly, it's been something that's been around for decades. It's not as new as it might seem for many of the discussions that we're having. Um, and at the, the Moran, it's, uh, or the University of Utah, I should say, it's still a, a relatively newer um, uh, project or scenario that Dr. Hartnett has been running um, for, um, I think, about five five years now. Um, and so um, as we expand uh, the teleophthalmology practices, both at the Moran, at the university, in our outreach, and then nationwide um, and globally, if we keep expanding outward, I think it's something important, uh, it's something that is important to consider in all its breadth. Um, sometimes I, I've found that it gets narrowed down to certain conversations or certain uh, types of technologies that are discussed. Um, but to think about how we're doing it and how we're doing it well, or maybe not so well. So um, I really want this to be interactive. I know it's tough over Zoom, so I'm gonna lean a little bit heavily on the standing room only audience um, that, that crowds this space. Um, so please do use the chat. If somebody's moderating, please let me know if there's questions that come up in the chat. Um, and I really do uh, want to invite your participation. So um, I have no financial, interest other than to make more money, hopefully someday, um, but nothing that relates to this talk. Um, what is teleophthalmology? So actually I wanna pose this question to the audience. So when I say teleophthalmology, uh, how would you define it or what comes to mind? There's so many answers, I can't hear them all at once. Um, Cole uh, is eating, uh, Sean. When you think of teleophthalmology, do you have a definition that comes to mind or certain practices? There are a lot of other forms of 
Yeah, and I don't know if people on Zoom can hear the audience, so just a quick summary. He um, said that he thinks of uh, the use of imaging and technologies um, for uh, expanding access kind of to remote areas. And I do think that for many people, I think myself included, that would be the first thing that comes to mind when I think of teleophthalmology. Um, maybe not if I said telemedicine, but definitely when I said teleophthalmology, I think that's probably the first thing that would come to mind. Um, but I'd like to kind of expand the, the definition a little bit. And I think it's important to do so because when we think about telehealth, telemedicine, and then teleophthalmology being a subset, we have to think of both the delivery of ophthalmic care. So that's, um, you know, could be screening, images, things like that, information, um, but then also education. So think of training, patient education. All of these things are part of what we use for telemedicine or telehealth. Um, and we use uh, telecommunication technologies. That can just be a phone. It could be a landline phone, it could be a cell phone, or we might use more advanced digital technologies. Now we're thinking about cameras, we're thinking about some of the other more modern technologies um, that we're using in health and we're using in uh, you know, telehealth in particular. Um, you know, things like Zoom, for example, would be uh, um, kind of probably both digital and telecommunication. Um, and so why do we, even need teleophthalmology um, or, you know, and I'm going to focus on teleophthalmology. Well, you know, COVID became one uh, very acute scenario where we needed it. Um, why? Because people couldn't come to the hospital. They couldn't come to the clinic for routine care or for non-routine care, even for acute care. There was huge barriers and we've talked about in other, um, you know, other grand rounds, other ethics grand rounds, even last time, you know, it was fear-based, but there was also policy and regulation that kept people from coming to the hospital for anything other than pretty much urgent or emergent care. And so there was a, a pretty rapid expansion on a policy level on an, and on a societal level for the use of telehealth, not just relegated to our specialty. One of the interesting things about ophthalmology is before, um, before COVID and COVID in particular, it was one of the most highly impacted specialties as far as the fall off of patient visits and available patient care that we saw of all specialties across the country. We also, before the pandemic, had the lowest use of telehealth, which actually surprised me because we think of ourselves as using technologies, being probably you know, kind of cutting edge, on, uh, using telescreening, teleretina, but overall, we were the lowest specialty, the, the specialty that used telehealth the lowest before the pandemic. This obviously changed during the pandemic and certain subspecialties in particular, neuro-ophthalmology, oculoplastics, were you know, able to use it quite readily, whereas others, retina, uveitis, things like that, where you need a lot of imaging or posterior segment exams, were less able to use it as, as successfully. But thinking past COVID as being you know, uh, something that was, you know, we're hopefully uh, fingers crossed, emerging away from in the next few months, we still need to think about teleophthalmology as a real need because there's an increasing number of people in this country um, and there's a decreasing ratio of available specialists, in particular um, ophthalmologists and retinal specialists. There's also the reality of distance and geography. Utah, I mean, probably captures it as, many, as much as any other state in the country because we have, yeah, we have the Salt Lake City Valley, we have this tertiary care center, the center of excellence. But once you get outside the Salt Lake City Valley, people are spread out and they have to travel a long way for specialty care. So even if they have primary, primary care, it's much harder for them to find access to ophthalmologists and in particular retinal specialists. And then also access, which we think of insurance, payment, people just having to work and the, the, uh, the effect that having to go to a doctor's appointment has on their, their work, their life, their family, and non-adherence, which we always think about as well, which often relates to social determinants of health or these factors. So now I would like to ask the increasing crowd, which is so nice to see, how do you guys use tele-ophthalmology uh, or telemedicine now? Like, what are the ways that you use it day in and day out? You can just like throw things out. Yeah, my chart's a huge way we use telehealth. Yeah. Yep, so smartphone usage is huge. The myriad of ways we use smartphones. 
Anything else you guys do on a regular basis? Yep. And it includes calling a patient on the phone. I think that that's like, I don't know, maybe like the low hanging obvious fruit we, th we forget about. Like if you just call a patient, whether it's from your smartphone, Doximity, or from the Moran, that's the tele, like that is the use of telehealth. You are using telecommunication to bridge distance for patient care and patient education. Any, uh, any other ways that people are using it? Sean already mentioned imaging, screening. He had, did some studies in Nepal um, regarding that. Anything else that, all right. Ah. So I think we kind of hit on virtual visits, screening. The other thing that uh, I know Dr. Rorosco uses a lot, I'm not sure who else is using this frequently, is at-home monitoring, which is becoming a more frequent thing. We use it in retina. It's going to become more prevalent in AMD, hopefully in DME, but they're also using it in glaucoma for pressure monitoring. And that is also telehealth and probably going to be incredibly helpful if you think about the patients we treat for their long-term care, especially in these chronic diseases that we're managing. And the other thing that we saw an uptick in, and Jeff Petty could talk a lot about, is teletraining. We're using this uh, in Navajo. We're increasing our usage with our global partners. But it's also what, uh, relevant to what Joe mentioned when you're just having consults and you can send you know, the fellow or the attending or whomever, the senior resident, a picture of your 20 die after exam. That is teletraining as well. Not only are you using it as a consult, but you're also saying, what the heck is going on here? And they can help out without going in person to evaluating the patient. I think I saw a chat there. I didn't catch it. Yep, all the time, especially uh, in pediatrics. I think we do this a lot because parents are often worried. Just they take a photo of a kid's eye. You can be like, yep, they need to come in. Oh, this is normal after the surgery. So how with the Moran are we using telehealth? Well, we talked about my, my chart. I uh, used, utilized a lot of virtual visits. These things we just talked about. The other thing is teleretina. And teleretina is just a subset of teleophthalmology or telehealth. When we think of teleretina, we think of screening. So diabetic screening is probably the, the biggest one because it's, there is such a, a high prevalence or incidence of diabetes. They all need to be screened, right, every year. 100% of diabetics need to be screened every year. Um, but we also have to think about ROP. And Dr. Hartnett, I don't know if she's on, but she's done a lot of work both in the diabetic retinopathy screening for telehealth here at the university, but also with ROP. And ROP across the country is it's actually interestingly becoming more and more of a standard of tele, uh, tele-ROP. Uh, Dr. Mof uh, Moshe out of um, Stanford has created a, I, I guess I don't know, a conglomerate or whatever, but that it is expanding where even some of the people I know who work um, you know, on the East Coast, uh, Dr. Calvo, who trained here in Nevada, where their ROP that they were doing uh, as part of their, uh, their practice, their institutional collaborations they have with local hospitals is changing. They're like moving away from these local retina specialists into this tele-ROP paradigm. And I think that it's become more and more commonplace, especially as uh, AI um, starts to pervade the, the diagnosis of plus disease and R, you know, ROP stages. So um, what we're doing here, in addition to what's already been done at the Utah Diabetic Center, where we have um, an AI camera in place that's screening any of the patients that come into the endocrinology uh, clinic there at the Diabetes Center in particular, is the VA um, is probably one of like the, the most important things to mention when it comes to the United States as far as teleretina is concerned, because it, it not only has been the, probably the most successful implementation, um, but also it was very uh, instrumental in uh, uh, spurring early adoption because the studies that came out of the VA's uh, tele, teleretinal programs show that it was successful in catching disease and a reliable way to, to do yearly screening for diabetics. Um, but then also we're trying to expand to what we're doing with from the, uh, an outreach or a public health perspective. Um, outreach becomes more and more narrow the way I think about it. But like, if you think about the, the trying to uh, capture everybody in the state with diabetes, whether they're geographically limited, uh, financially limited. We need to think about also uh, how we're, we're, or not, we don't need, need to think, we are thinking about how we're uh, catching all the diabetics in Navajo, right? So um, we go down there on a regular basis, we do screening, but obviously this, we're going to capture more patients if we can do it in a, uh, a telehealth paradigm where they're going to their primary care doctor, they're getting point of care screening, and then hopefully maybe point of care diagnosis as well. Um, so 
a little bit, I just kind of mentioned point of care screening and point of care diagnosis. I think these are two features of teleretina in particular that are really important um, for a couple of reasons. One is every time you separate um, either by time or distance, uh, one, uh, I think the uh, one visit or one implementation of healthcare to another, I think there's a chance for non-adherence, for loss of follow-up, or for worse outcomes, right? So the more immediate the result for the patient, I think the better we have as far as getting patients outcomes and helping them understand their care as well. And so there's been a, a, a shift um, that happened many years ago with point of care screening. And the VA, as I said, was one of the, the, the leaders in the United States on this. And what does that mean? That means that when a patient goes into their primary care uh, clinic or any other clinic, but in this case, it's generally primary care clinic, that they get a photo taken at that time. They don't have to go to a separate visit. They don't have to come back for a bit, uh, just an imaging only appointment. They don't have to go to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist or any uh, retina specialist, anybody. They get the, the picture they're done there. Now, for a long time, that picture still didn't have to be transmitted, um, you know, using some technology and read by uh, a physician. Um, and then the result will be conveyed back to the primary care doctor and conveyed to the patient. This was a huge improvement, but it, we still lost people to follow up because then you have um, this delay in from their point of the imaging to the diagnosis, which I think creates a psychological barrier. But then also you have like the, the process of getting the primary care doctor to follow up and the result, the patient getting referred. And I think the more steps you add, the more time you add, the, the more chance we have for failure. So with the advent of artificial intelligence, um, we've been able to now start implementing point of uh, care diagnosis, where when the patient gets the image, they get an immediate or near immediate result that tells them you have disease, you need to go to your, your doctor. And I think this is making, um, I think this is, is mass, massively impactful. So for example, we have this process implemented at the uh, Utah Diabetes Center. So as soon as a patient comes in, they get their, um, uh, their appointment with their primary care doctor, they get their A1C checked, they get their nerves checked, and they get an image. And if it says that they have DR, and then in particular with the um, uh, software you, we're using, which is INUC, they also can get a result that says you have vision threatening DR, which is even like a higher urgency referral. And immediately uh, we're creating a system where immediately that patient gets referred to us that right there. So like they're getting a referral that is sent either via email or through Epic for that patient to be referred. And soon, it will, you know, hopefully, cross our fingers, it'll be integrated into Epic so that that just happens as a, like a boom, 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 autom automated result. So you can imagine how, how helpful that is for the patient where they know what's happening, why it's happening, where they're going by the time that they leave their, um, their appointment or to at least expect a call you know, the next day to, to get in a follow-up appointment. So what's interesting about all this is the, the, like a, a great capture of the paradox uh, of what it, healthcare in America to me is America is actually a, really bad for how good of technology we have and how good of healthcare we should have at screening diabetics. Right, whether there's metrics for primary care clinics, hospitals, institutions, and I think it's like upwards like 80%, like they have to reach of their diabetic screening. Across the board, depending on the studies you look at, it's like we're 15 to 50%. We're, we're, we're bad, we're not doing well. You look at England, right, where they have a nationalized healthcare system, they've reached 83% of screening and have lowered diabetic retinopathy as one of the major um, causes of blindness in their country as a result. Now, I'm not here, to, I'm not trying to be political, but the other side of this is, okay, yes, it is probably because we're so uh, decentralized and we're so fractured in how we deliver healthcare and our EHRs don't communicate well, just trying to get a camera or a software to integrate into one EHR, much less three, is an act of Congress, and you know how Congress is. So the other part of it, though, is because we're so bad, we, it has spurred the advent of AI and these other very successful technologies, right? Because you're now like, because we're so bad, we have to figure out other ways to do it well. So they're like, well, then this is how AI has become um, now an FDA approved technology with two softwares that are allowed to do it um, with two cameras. And so hopefully we can um, bridge the gap and actually uh, conquer this mountain ahead of us. And I think we're, we're making it there, but it is an interesting way of looking uh, at American healthcare. So what? Uh, 
Um, yeah, the good question. So the, and I'll get to that a little bit as a barrier, but, oh, so uh, Dr. Petty asked, are the, the financial reimbursement, uh, is the reimbursement or financial incentives of telescreening aligned to support it as a primary care model where they make money um, versus uh, the, op the optometrist or ophthalmologist or versus nobody? Um, and the answer is, I'll get into a little bit later as one of the, the barriers to uh, um, and pitfalls of teleophthalmology, but it, it's more aligned with it for the primary care uh, model. So it's, it's um, more sustainable, more lucrative for them, except it really depends on the payer mix. And overall, it's actually a huge barrier to successfully implementing tele-ophthalmology screening programs um, on a large scale, especially when you start diving into uh, you know, un uh, unideal uh, payer mixes. So where is tele-ophthalmology or telemedicine going? So um, a few things that I'll just kind of quickly point out. Um, so hopefully leg legislative expansion, COVID was something that um, you know, spurred a, a fair bit of legislation regarding uh, telehealth, although some of it has fallen off. And I think there's a lot, uh, a, a lot more need for additional advocacy to um, retake some of the ground that we lost after COVID and then, to, uh, and then to probably gain some additional ground as well. Um, I think the, the artificial intelligence, we're gonna see a, a fairly um, significant expansion in the next few years. So right now we have basically, um, you know, two cameras and two softwares that are FDA approved, you know, so there's gonna be expansion to other camera models um, and it's only approved for DR. So hopefully we'll start seeing, uh, you know, it expand into other disease states, glaucoma, AMD being the, probably the, the next um, that are gonna be uh, highly relevant. Smartphone usage. So already we use smartphones for a lot of things. And I think ophthalmology, I don't know if it's the most, but it's gotta be one of the most as far as uh, utilizing smartphones in daily practice. So you think on consults, we can use it for the Snellen chart. We can use it for um, a number of the, like, you know, the, the exams we do that we don't have access to the in-clinic tools. We also use it for taking photos with our smartphone imaging that people use in remote scenarios. Um, but I think that as, you know, you think about how fast uh, smartphone technologies are expanding with augmented reality and, and the computing power, I think it's gonna continue to be more and more of a technology that we can use like even for uh, you know, uh, at-home screening, for example, um, and, and utilization of that. The other thing is teletreatment. You know, that's something that we haven't really explored yet, but we're, we're not too far off. I would actually maybe say we're there, um, which um, the, I don't know if anybody's ever used this laser, but the Novelist laser is a laser that you can um, basically plan and then deliver a retinal laser either a focal or pan retinal peripheral laser um, using uh, uh, or you know, basically like across distance. So you can work in three paradigms of the way, they, the way that they promote it. It can be distance learning, distance guiding or remote planning. So it can be used completely remotely without um, somebody there who's an ophthalmologist or it could be used as a way of staffing um, a trainee. Or you know, if you're thinking about what we do globally, we could be helping um, an ophthalmologist who doesn't have a lot of retinal experience from here by basically what they use is the, the fundus photography. You can also use FA. And then it plans the entire laser and then it can deliver it uh, with um, uh, the, uh, the algorithm able to uh, basically avoid areas that are um, you know, no fly zones. I hate that they use that right now, um, but that is what the, the terminology they use on their website so that they have a no fly zone for where the laser won't hit. So, this is gonna be more and more of a reality. There's other, a group out of Stanford that's also looking at um, remote delivery of, uh, of retinal laser as well. And then I know that there's a, a number of groups that are looking at um, how to uh, um, create and implement um, tele-injections, which I think we're a ways off from that, um, but it's already in the works and you know, robotic surgery is already here. It, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of, uh, when not if, um, and then the adoption will obviously be important. But it, it, this, this is a really interesting technology that um, you know, kind of offline, I think we should really discuss for some of the stuff we do with uh, outreach and with our global partners. Um, so trying to get back to a little bit more as we get into the, the ethics of it, as we um, start to look at the ethics and the, uh, bring this back to an ethics conference. 
what are the things that you see as as far as the future? Not the things we're using right now, but what the things that we're not yet doing that's going to be the most impactful for what we do in ophthalmology. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes, like it's, I agree. And we're doing the, so uh, one of the things that was said was the ability to securely text patients and communicate. Um, with providers across um, healthcare systems. Um, you know, we, we probably do so a lot, uh, not us, but other people in the, in, the, in the country probably do so in ways that are not truly secure and we don't even realize it if we had to be honest. Um, but um, I think that some of that is just awareness. So finding ways that we can be uh, absolutely compliant with the, the security that we should be using um, and then the other one was the ability for EHRs to communicate. So you really have a true snapshot and not even a snapshot, like a full, um, you know, detailed picture of a patient's health who's getting care at multiple institutions. And we've kind of piecemeal addressed some of these things, right? That's the thing is like my chart is a, a, a start, but not every patient has my chart. Sometimes I get on my chart to send a patient a message and I realize they don't even have it. Um, and so, you know, you're kind of stuck with the old, the old school approaches and then care everywhere, um, you know, is a start, but I think 80% of the time I need it, it doesn't really offer me much at all. Um, and I think that the, that the latter part is going to have to be uh, a policy-based uh, decision. Like there's an eventually just have to be a law that says that EHRs have to communicate and have to communicate in a meaningful way because there's so much proprietary interest that are keeping things from happening um, in, a, in a rational or in a patient-centric way. Um, and it, there's just at this point to me, there's just no reason not to, but I think it has to come from the government. Um, and uh, it seems like they have other things on their mind presently. All right, anything else? So present barriers. Um, so I think the, the main barriers to uh, more and more implementation of teleophthalmology, whether it's telescreening, teletreatment, anything, cost and reimbursement is a huge one. Um, you know, and it, it, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Technology, I think the technologies are actually the things that are happening the fastest, and it's a lot of it, uh, catch up in relation to uh, policy, regulation, um, you know, cost, et cetera. Um, personnel, even though it's supposed to eliminate or decrease the need for certain personnel, I think there's still a barrier in the sense of a lot of these technologies need training. So, uh, and um, you have a high turnover in a lot of the positions that are using them on the ground level. So boots on the ground level and then legal and reg regulatory, as we mentioned. So let's talk about the ethics since this is an ethics grand rounds and we kind of just had like an overview of, of teleophthalmology. I think there's a number of uh, ethical considerations for telemedicine, telehealth, and in, um, you know, in our world, uh, teleophthalmology. And so speaking in particular to teleophthalmology, these are the ones, the primary ones that I identified. I'm very interested if anybody has any additional ethical considerations that, uh, that they face or that they think are relevant. Um, the obvious one, patient privacy. Um, we talk about patient privacy a lot. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's something we like go through a HIPAA, you know, um, course every year, year after year. And I think in a way that's very good, but I think in a way it also is a disservice. I think we've started thinking about privacy in a way that's really narrowed it down to like what we learn in those HIPAA courses, which is like, don't think, leave things on faxes, you know, your, how to transmit the data electronically. But why, why does, privacy even an ethical consideration? Why are we even talking about that, right? Like, and the reason is, is that privacy goes into patient autonomy, right? Confidentiality, the patient-physician uh, relationship, human dignity, like the right to be able to have a disease state or, you know, when we th start thinking about reproductive or sexual health and have a relationship with somebody in a way that you know that your dignity and your, your privacy is protected. But also privacy is not just your, uh, you know, the way we think about it with the transmission of data, it's also um, security. So security is something I think the HIPAA courses do a great job of covering, and that's the security. How are the institutions 
and the technologies we use securing your data, right? So when we come to teleophthalmology, I think it's an incredible thing to think about. And luckily with some of the things, anything that's getting FDA approved and probably be in, being implemented in a clinic like telescreening, those things are, should be built into it, right? In order to get FDA approval, in order to be implemented in the healthcare system, they're probably having those security measures and those HIPAA compliance uh, measures implemented. But what about the things we do that we talked about on a daily basis, right? Consults, texts, patients, um, patient calls, things like that, right? Um, question that I, I have, is iMessage HIPAA compliant? It is end-to-end -end encrypted. It's secure, but is it HIPAA compliant? I have one no head shake. That's correct. It is not. Why is it not? It's it's encrypted. It has the the features of what it uh, you know it should be secure enough. But why is it not HIPAA compliant? I I didn't know either. I had to look it up. So <laughs> there's two reasons. One is that there's no business relationship between Apple and the healthcare you know whatever uh, facilities or institutions. That, and so that's one reason. That's the, but that's probably a, a soft reason. The other reason is if you have your iCloud backup on, and this is just an important thing for digital privacy that if, if you didn't know, now you know. If you have your iCloud backup on, even though every message you send is very encrypted and probably impossible to be uh, you know, intercepted or uh, hacked, your iCloud backup contains a key which Apple owns. And so it is susceptible to both hackers or, you know, uh, Third party government warrants, et cetera. So, everything that's stored on your iCloud, even though it is encrypted, it can be hacked, it can be intercepted. And so, that's why it's not HIPAA compliant. So, unless that changes, that is not. So, there's other apps like Signal is, is HIPAA compliant. And then there's, you know, um, there actually are a couple um, healthcare based secure messaging apps. I just don't think they're very widely used. People don't know about them that you can also utilize for patient, um, you know, patient information. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions of, or anything about privacy? I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do think it's actually very important to think of it past just what, you know, what we kind of answer questions on, on the, on the um, educational courses every year. All right. A hundred percent. And that goes, I goes right into the next slide. Like perfect. Um, and that is that you, when you do screening, A, you're going to identify disease. Um, and if you don't have a way to treat it, that's one consideration. But also if you can't identify what the, the proper, if you can't uh, screen them properly, you have to have a plan in place to get those patients an exam and proper ophthalmic care. So, and both are important. So there's best practices that have been, that have been suggested by the Academy, as well as a number of other uh, medical uh, organizations regarding telehealth and telescreening. One of them relates to this, ungradable images. What do you do with that? Well, best practices is that patient needs an exam within a certain time frame. If you haven't even identified a way to get patients who have identifiable disease, vision-threatening DR to get care, which is a real problem. Like, when you start trying to work in this space and you're working with a clinic, a primary clinic, you know, I don't know, in, in a, uh, you know, Alaska or something, I don't know, which is somewhere very far rural, they just need to get their metrics up. They need to screen their diabetics. And I wish it wasn't the, always the case, but sometimes that's really how they're thinking. They're really not thinking about, I need to make sure this patient doesn't go blind. They're really just like, I need to get my screening metrics to par and screen my diabetics. And so then you're trying to be like, yes, but we also, need to make sure that if they have disease, that they don't go blind. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but, but after we figure out the screening, right? And it's a real problem. And that's a problem for a lot of public health, right? There's a mantra in public health that you don't study something unless, a study some, a population unless you can help them. But I think it goes to screening as well. You don't screen a population unless you can provide some help or at least some semblance of future help. And I think the same thing goes to these ungradable images. You know, if, you, if you're like, well, and there was actually a, um, a study that came out of Thailand and I appreciate uh, Mike Murray for providing this reference in this slide. 
um, where they looked at the, like the real world uh, implementation of a, a telescreening program. And I, this is a very real thing where um, you get a patient and they have one eye that's perfectly gradable and the other eye is like, eh, it probably shouldn't be gradable, just to be honest. And you get that. And I think a lot of providers in real world are like, well, you know, they kind of look around the glare and they move the picture and brighten the screen, do a few things. And they say, well, I, yeah, that's probably fine. That's not the way it should be. Breast practices of that patient, because if they have a media opacity, you can't see the, the entire picture, needs an ophthalmic examination. But if you haven't figured out a, a very like easy way for that patient to get that, it becomes a barrier. And then it becomes in a way that you fail the patient on an ethical level and um, like on a liability level as well. All right, the other part that kind of relates to this is if we're doing telescreening in particular, what are we missing, right? What are we missing? Because most, most of the time, we're not using ultra wide field uh, cameras. And this is something that again, on like a regulatory level, on a policy and reimbursement level could change. But the problem is, right, we have non-midriatic ultra wide field cameras, the Optos. We use it every day. It has incredible images that you can get through a non-dilated uh, pupil, but it costs a lot of money. And the reimbursement is not set up for any clinic, especially when you start dealing with clinics that are serving underserved populations to buy an Optos. So we're most often, and what has been standard, it is standard, the standard of care is to use either 45 degree or 50 degree fundus photos. And maybe like the, the uh, INUC will take two, they'll take a, a macular centered and a nerve centered, but not always, that's not the standard. The standard still would allow for a 45 or 50 degree macular centered um, uh, uh, image. So the, there was one study that looked at this and they, they noted that just related to diabetic retinopathy in about 10% of these cases, there would be peripheral findings that would change the grade of diabetic retinopathy. Right. So if you think of the number of diabetics we have in the country, if you're screening them all point of care screening, if that's where we're going, you're missing a lot of people, a lot. But then you also have to think about the rare diseases. Yeah, they're rare, but if you have a half percent who have a retinal tear or, you know, 0.1% who have a tumor that's out in the ciliary body that an optos would catch, those patients think they're getting adequate care. They think that that is a substitute from ophthalmic examination. And a lot of places, when you look at what their practices are, when you read about what they're implementing, are using telescreening this way. They are not necessarily requiring that every few years, whether it's three years, which is uh, what we've decided with some of the charitable clinics, that every three years, a patient should have a full dilated examination. And I think that's best practice supporting the academy as well. And they, they, they should have an exam within the first year of implementing their telescreening as well, right? Either they've had it, uh, a year prior, or if they haven't within the first year, even if you take the picture, they should have an ophthalmic examination with a dilated exam. I don't think that that's really happening nationwide. And especially with the use of these AI technologies that are gonna be implemented um, in, you know, in primary care clinics, in Walgreens, who knows? I think that the patients are gonna think that this is a substitute. And I think a lot of things will be missed. We're gonna see late pre presentation of peripheral disease. And so I think it's something that we have to consider. We also have to think about whose liability, whose responsibility is that, right? If you, as a, uh, you know, an ophthalmologist, help a primary care clinic implement an AI-based program, is it all the company's liability? Are you partially liable? Is it all the, the primary care doctor that's liable? I actually don't know. If you're, if you're the physician, it sounds like that there is some liability on you if you miss things, but if it's outside the, the purview of the, of the image, then the liability gets a lot more murky. Liability and responsibility are two different things. I think we have a responsibility to our patient, even if we don't always necessarily have a legal liability. So. Any thoughts? So um, Ariane also mentioned that we have, um, a, we might have a biased uh, um, 
image database based on the way that AI has is created with deep learning. And I think Marshall had a, an excellent ex ethics going around a while back on this. And so if he was here, I'd ask him because he knows a lot more about it. But basically, it's the um, a subset of the garbage in, garbage out phenomenon, right? If you put a lot of images in, but they're all of one social demographic, and then you're screening a totally different different graphic, are your AI algorithms accurate? And the problem is we don't really know. We just assume they are because a lot of that's happening in that proverbial black box. Um, and that's a very good point. The other point regarding AI and what is missed is if you're using AI and it's only set up for DR and you don't have a secondary uh, physician read, you're missing glaucoma, you're missing AMD, you're missing anything else basically. And I think that's a very real thing. And I think that we have to think about that. Hopefully with as AI expands into those other diseases, some of that will be less significant. But, um, you know, for example, Temple has a really uh, beautiful program set up where they have the uh, utilization of both um, uh, autonomous AI, AI and AI assisted reads that still have a physician overread. So the DR portion will always get an AI read um, or an AI assisted, but then no matter if it's AI autonomous or AI assisted, it then goes to a secondary physician read for those other diseases. And I think, um, and I'm not an expert on this, but I'm pretty sure that the reimbursement model does allow for this. Um, but I, I, that would have to, like, I would like to talk to a coding expert, like whether they're able to do double bill, especially for AI, and we'll get into this in a second, there's two different codes or separate codes, but um, it'll be interesting to know that we're, uh, it's something that I'm interested in trying to implement into what we're doing. Um, and so I'm trying, I'll have to learn a little bit more about how that coding works, but um, I think it's, a, it's an important point about what AI is missing. And we have to keep considering that at the more and more we use AI for any, any part of healthcare. So um, I don't know if people can hear, but that uh, Tyler has a particular knack for also reading my mind um, and made an ex excellent, excellent uh, point and reference. So Abraham Vergasi, who wrote um, uh, um, Cutting for Stone and is a physician, internal infectious disease physician at Stanford, has written a lot and talked a lot about this. And uh, one of the things he says is the, the virtual patient, meaning the patient an epic on our EHR in America gets phenomenal care, but the actual patient maybe sometimes suffers um, because of the way we set this up. And um, it's true that like you think about the way, I mean, we're probably not as bad as some specialties because we're forced to look at the patient's eye and we touch them. But a lot of specialties, like they go in there, look at the screen, you look at all the labs, you do your rounds now in the hospital, in a room separated from the patient's bedside. And you feel really good about what you're doing, but the patient has no idea what's going on and has probably never been touched. You know, there's no physical exam. And um, he also, it, it also does relate to the specter of what's missed. We feel like we're doing a great job of screening for diabetics, but are we really doing the best for the patients always? And maybe not. And so I'm going to skip ahead and then come back. <laughs> the, the whole, it was beautiful what he says. And someday you should uh, just look at, uh, or sorry, uh, watch the TED talk. Um, he talks about the physical exam as a ritual, uh, you know, to think of it beyond um, just something we do to identify disease, which it is also, it is also that function. And in ophthalmology, we have, are very reliant upon the physical exam. Um, one of the first things that was taught to me when I was a first year residency resident by one of my uh, chiefs was that the we're kind of lucky in ophthalmology, especially when you're treating patients you can't even communicate very well with because you can often make the diagnosis just by the physical exam. We can see almost everything. And now that's not always true, but it's an incredibly important part of what we do. And I think that that's why we have a unique uh, perspective on this of like what is lost with the virtual visit compared to when we see that patient in clinic. But he talks about it at a step further about the ritual of the physical exam being something that is a ritual of transformation. And he compares it to weddings and 
the ceremonies of matrimony and then the rituals of um, transfer of power and how these rituals have been ingrained in our society to um, represent and help us understand transformation. And so in the, the patient doctor relationship, he believed that something as a ritual of creating or transforming something from where there is a, a coldness to something there where there is trust and there is a relationship formed that is very real and allows for what like the, 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 the full and holistic version of healing should. Um, and so I just wanted to skip ahead because Tyler mentioned that, but I'm going to go back here. We got about 10 minutes. I think we have time to, to keep on rolling here. Perfect. Fluid around the heart, fluid in the lung. As he described in this wonderful manuscript, Inventum Novum, New Invention, which would have you know what? You get, you get to hear his deep, booming voice. Not funny. All right. There we go. All right, so. Testing, testing. Boom, boom. Okay, back on track. A little detour. All right. That played a lot differently in my mind, how that was going to work. Just want to let you guys know on that one. <laughs> um, so then we've also talked about cost and value. And I think, why do I, would I include costs as an ethical consideration? Because I think we have to think about cost and reimbursement ethically as a society, as well as as providers and as individual providers. Because we have to think about the way that it is influencing the care we provide and the care we're able to provide. And I think that is why the importance of advocation in our profession is, of, is, is so high, is so significant. So what Dr. Petty mentioned earlier about like, well, what is the reimbursement? How is it set up? Well, in short, there's three codes um, for telescreening. And then there's also codes for uh, televisits. During the pandemic for televisits, they allowed both uh, broadband, so virtual visits and telephone visits to reimburse. Unfortunately, after the pandemic, the telephone uh, uh, visit type has had, that reimbursement has fallen off, especially with commercial providers. So now you have a scenario where only people who have access to broadband can utilize virtual visits, like true virtual telehealth visits. And you can kind of already think about where this is going. And then for telescreening, the, the reimbursement, I, and I gotta be curious everybody saw, so I'm just gonna tell you. So uh, reimbursement, if the patient does not have a disease, is like $16, okay? That's for a physician read of an image. If they have identified disease, it goes up to around 26 to $30, okay? If, so if they have disease, and then for every uh, exam after that, it can be billed like that, although then, then they often should be in a, a clinic office anyways. And then for AI, there was a recent, the re, it was recently uh, valued. So now it's like 45 to $50, right? It's for an AI read. So the physician read is less than a third of the AI read. And the, the argument for that is, well, the technology that was, you know, the, a, the research and development and the technology. But how does that like, I mean, what, what are you guys' thoughts on, on the, on what that does. I mean, I'm just kind of curious, like in, in a, both like how it makes you feel about the value of your expertise and what it does to, a, um, you know, a telescreening program on a large scale. Dr. Bernstein. Thank you. 
Um, so speaking to both of those, those things and kind of moving on, um, the, other, the, um, the other thing that the, and so one of the things Dr. Petty mentioned was the, the incentivizing AI as the form of, you may speak. Sorry, Eric, I was, great presentation. I was just gonna um, just drop a comment that uh, I used to work with one of the diabetic uh, retinopathy screening programs, a startup in San Jose, and they were one of the first companies to actually supply all of their, their database and images and develop the algorithm, the AI algorithm with Google. And one issue that they ran into is kind of what you were alluding to with just the holistic and kind of the, um, the approach with the physical exam that they found in following up with their patients that 25% of patients with a positive diabetic retinopathy screening did not, the only, sorry, only 10 to 25% of patients actually went to an ophthalmologist and actually followed up, even when they had referrals in order and even when they, they had a positive exam. So, and Google couldn't really wrap their head around the fact that there wasn't good follow-up, but I think, like you said, there's something in actually physically talking to a patient and, and educate, educating them about what the screening is for. Um, so even though we have this technology, AI, and detecting disease, um, 75 to 80% of patients aren't even going to an ophthalmologist or following up with a referral. Absolutely. Thank you. God speaking. Thank you for your insight and wisdom. Um, so um, I know we're kind of running out of time, and so I want I do want to get to uh, uh, the digital vibe, which I think is a huge part of thinking about teleophthalmology, and it, it it relates to all that we've talked about. So it's related to access to broadband. So now, if you have de-incentivized and done away with the reimbursement for telephone, but you said, okay, we'll still do it for broadband, but some around twenty, more likely forty million people in this country mostly people of depressed socioeconomic backgrounds um, and a uh, higher percentage of minorities don't have broadband access. Well, you've, guess what you've just done? You've given better care, you've created a tier of care artificially. And the question is, who should telehealth or teleophthalmology benefit most? It's a trick question. It should benefit everybody equitably, right? Like that is the ideal. We provide healthcare as physicians and supposedly as a as, um, society equitably. But what's happening is that's not the case. And one of the things that happened during COVID is because of the rapid expansion, we were able to look at what was actually happening, including in teleophthalmology. And what we're seeing is that the utilization of teleophthalmology services is skewed towards younger people more educated people, uh, more affluent people. And there's a number of reasons for this, all of which go into the great chasm we call the digital divide, which is the widening gap between those who have access to technologies or have technology literacy and those who don't as society progresses forward in a certain way. And, what they, and so it's important to note, and one question I kind of had to myself is by identifying disparity in usage, are you identi identifying disparities in care? And I think that is an important thing to understand, right? So it doesn't mean that the results are different, but we are seeing early on that people in uh, like uh, minority populations, people in uh, you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds are not using telehealth as well. And then it gets even more complicated because a lot of these tele-screening programs that are being built around the country, like in California where they had huge statewide implementation with government support, were to support some of these um, uh, underserved populations. But then if we create a cost scenario where the clinics that are providing care to underserved populations cannot afford AI and can't afford most of the other types of software that are out there for telescreening, we're actually making the situation worse where the people who can go to the like fancy primary care doctor, they can get the, you know, their AI screening, get their printout, go home, boom, boom, boom. But, but the clinics that can't afford the $30 uh, or whatever click fee when a certain percentage of their population is uninsured and won't reimburse, they can't do that. It's not even an option, right? They don't have the funding. And so now you're creating a widening gap, even of the care that you were supposed to be, um, you know, decreasing with these new technologies. 
And so right now, we're, I think we're still in the phase of identification. OK, these disparities, disparities are exist, exist and are widening, but we still don't understand how we're going to address it. I think it has to be on a policy level. And also, what are the outcomes from this gap? And I think those are the next steps from a research standpoint. I'm going to skip these cases, um, but basically, um, the people you think might benefit don't benefit as much. We got to think about um, real uh, answers to these problems. So like one way for people who don't have access to broadband, there should be like Wi-Fi um, broadband uh, spots that patients can go, um, or government should support a uh, broad rollout of broadband to make it a, uh, you know, basically a human right in our modern society to identify and, and list it as a social determinant of health, because that will change the way we study it and uh, think about it from a healthcare implementation. And then we already touched about the touch beyond the screens. I think it's important to note that beyond just what Dr. Fergasi was uh, mentioning with the ritual of the physical exam, there's also very real cultural differences in what people want or expect out of their healthcare visit. Like maybe some of us are very comfortable with a virtual visit, that feels good, but for other patients, maybe older or different cultural backgrounds, it doesn't feel like they saw the doctor. Like there's something about being in person, there's something about the physical exam, the physical touch, et cetera, that makes them feel like they actually saw the physician and got medical care. And I think we have to be cognizant of that. Don't treat every person the same, right? Like allow those differences to exist in order for the outcomes to be equitable. One more thing. Oh yeah, um, so it's a TED talk by, um, I'm gonna show you here. Uh, it's a TED talk by uh, Abraham Bergasi. Why does it do that? Um, so you could just, uh, on the uh, importance of touch for the physical exam, I'm losing the spot. Here you go. The doctor's touch, TED Global 2011, saw it here first. Um, all right, well, I, I, I left no minutes for questions and commentary. But if you have any, I'll stay.